The world is not transformed by convenience. It's transformed by sacrifice. Every single thing that we enjoy is a result of someone's sacrifice. When people think that is an outdated system, they should know that not only does it still work, it might be the only thing that still works. And uh, just to give you an update, uh, oil change ministry, because of your sacrificial giving, if you don't know what that is, it's, it's our church family providing free oil and filter changes to single parent moms, uh, to spouses of military, to senior citizens on limited income. And uh, all they get is served by our church family. We don't expect anything from them. We just want to help people in our community. They don't even have to attend here. And uh, uh, so yesterday, 50 people were served and had their oil and filters changed. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. So good morning. How you doing? Do you think this is going to be a long message or a short message today? Somebody said yes. <laughs> you need to fill out a job application. Uh, we can put you to work here. Um, so we're in Joshua, and we're not necessarily going through this story in sequence. Uh, we're hitting points in terms of a, a process that we're going through as a church family. And the season that we're in is called the next initiative or the next campaign. And I would just like us to say this out loud and together. With God, there is always a next. Let's try that one more time. With God, there is always a next. Sometimes we feel like we've crossed some invisible line where we've disqualified ourselves and God can no longer use us, and it's simply not true. Sometimes we feel like we've just run out of steam, we have no more strength, and so the future before us is just a barren wasteland. Not true. It is true that with God there is always a next. It is also true that there are steps that we have to take in order to be open to the possibilities that God has for us. And so we're in Joshua chapter 3 today. We're going to begin in verse 7, and this is one of the more exciting and heroic stories in the Old Testament. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Gergesites, Amorites, and Jebusites. I should get an amen just for saying those all correctly. I mean... The only thing we left out was the termites. <laughs> See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. As soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan. While the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. It's quite a story. Uh, I've actually seen the Jordan River, and by every standard, it's ordinary. It's not an extraordinary river. Uh, in lots of places, it's only maybe 30, 35 feet across. And uh, in lots of times in the year, you could easily wade across it. Um, but if you saw it at flood stage, that would actually be a very different experience. Flood stage occurs during harvest time. There's a thing called ladder rain. And what that is is uh, 
uh, the way the growing seasons work in that part of the world is they plant their crops just before there's what's called the early rains. And the early rains come and kind of get everything sprouted and going. And then they go through uh, what's kind of a difficult growing season because it's a very arid part of the world, but then move in the latter rain or the, the end of the season rains, and that's what makes everything just explode in fruition. But all of that rain creates incredible torrents of water that go into the Jordan River and all the tributaries that feed into it. On top of that, at that time of year, there's snow melt that's coming down from the mountains of Lebanon, and the water that's also that they're getting from rain is added into that. So what you wind up with is something that looks more like this than a nice serene little stream that people could have a picnic beside. This is the stuff that in the United States, that's where we build our houses, and then they have to send in boats and helicopters to get us out of there. But that's what it looked like. The water is rushing, the sound is deafening, the current is devastating. The last thing you want to be is pulled into that. And this is a story that deals with a miracle in that exact setting. Now, a miracle is something that people can struggle with. Uh, there's lots of people who say, I'm not sure that I can believe that something that seems to defy the laws of nature is possible. And uh, so they'll read through scripture and uh, in fact, uh, a very famous politician back around the founding time of our country went through the New Testament and cut out every single miracle in, that's listed there. And uh, he said that what was left was the only thing he could believe. We have to decide, I, I think, if we're open to the possibility, not can you create one or control one, but if you're open to the possibility that God can do something beyond what you can do. So. Uh, Israel is in a situation where they're being called to cross over. Now, what's interesting is if they waited just eight weeks, they wouldn't need a miracle. They could just wait across. It's not that hard in most places on the Jordan. It would have been an easy crossing for them. And you can make the argument, uh, why did God want them to cross now? I mean, they've already waited 80 years to get here. What's eight more weeks? It's not that big a deal. And the answer is we don't know exactly why God wanted them to cross at this time except maybe to verify to them that he was with them in very powerful ways. Or even if you are involved in the military conquest that's going to occur on the other side of this, it's highly likely that the military troops of the uh, cities of that area would not have been prepared for military battle because they wouldn't assume anybody could get across that at this time of year, which brings up another issue that I'd like to deal with, and that is that there are lots of modern people, particularly Americans, who get very offended that God would tell Israel to cross into Canaan and conquer cities and cultures that are not their own. They, they, they view that as, you know, what kind of God does that? And, and who are they to go and take something someone else has, has worked their lives for? And so I, I would just like to bring that point out because there's a lot that's not understood. You know, when people make statements like that, uh, they're not recognizing what those cultures were actually like. Those cultures didn't just tolerate preying upon the weakest, which were children and women. They institutionalized it. I could start telling you right now some of the things that they did to the weakest of their society, and it would enrage you. In fact, when we hear things like that in the news now, we're the ones who stand up and say, somebody needs to do something about that. We have to decide. If you can't both blame God for the problems in the world and then blame God when he does something about them. It's just, it's not a good position to be in. And so God had given these cultures generation after generation where some leader could rise up and steer this thing away from this incredibly destructive past uh, uh, process that they were engaging in against the weakest of their members, and, and they just continue to get worse and worse until their culture is completely saturated by it. So Israel comes in for the purpose of freeing that entire region from that kind of terror and fear. And so they, it could well be that one of the reasons God wanted to use this time is because the military on the other side would not be prepared. So God told Joshua they were going to cross in 
three days. So I've got a question for you that we're going to kind of process this morning, and that is, what would it take for you to enter your next adventure in faith? What would it take for you to enter your next adventure in faith? And so I think to enter your next adventure, you need to know you're going to need God's help. This is not just something you can do on your own. This isn't a pep talk or a, a, a sermon that if you listen to, somehow you'll feel more emboldened. That, that's not what I'm after here. I don't, I don't want you to have more confidence in yourself. I want you to have more confidence in God. He's the one who can actually help us. It's one thing to talk about something. It's one thing to dream about something. It's one thing to hope in something. It's another thing to actually do something about it. I can remember when my wife and I were talking about getting married, we were sitting in a park. We hadn't had any specific plans. We were just considering the possibilities. There is a great deal of difference between a casual conversation in a park and actually walking down an aisle and making precious promises. And if you've been in a wedding, you know. All of a sudden, you feel anxious, and nauseous, you sweat profusely. I had one person at a wedding say, I don't know what to do. My hands are sweating and my tongue is dry. I said, try rubbing your palms on your tongue and see what, what happens. Maybe that'll help. I don't know. We'll, we'll get you through this. So, they're being called to take a step forward at a time when that's going to require more than they're able to do. They can't get across that stream, that river. And that ring brings the issue of miracles. Sometimes we consider miracles to be like the special effects department of God's kingdom. And that's not what they are. Uh, God doesn't do miracles just so we go, oh, wow, that was, that was cool. That's good. I like that one. I rate that a 9.7 on a 10 scale. That's, that's not what it is. Miracles actually require, please hear this, miracles require our participation. Miracles require our faith. They're not a substitute for our faith. There's lots of people who say, well, if I could see a miracle, then I would believe. If you could see a miracle, then what's your, where's the faith that's required? God doesn't do miracles to take the need for faith away from us. There's a different thing that's happening. So, nearly 80 years earlier, God had brought people through this, uh, uh, another supernatural crossing. It was of the Red Sea under the leader Moses. And there's a lot of things that are in common, but there's a couple of things that stand out as quite different. And the first thing that we notice is different is in the Red Sea crossing, they are escaping out of bondage. In the Jordan River crossing, they are entering into promise. It's a very big difference between trying to get away from something and break into something. And it's, it's amazing how how often God's people are willing to cry out to God to get us out of something. I mean, we've all done it, right? We're in a bad situation. We're going through a difficult season. We, we can't see how it's going to work out. We're, we're frustrated by our own inabilities, and so we just cry out to God to get us out of this painful thing. But how many of us are willing to cry out to God and ask him to do something beyond our ability just to get us into the next thing of his purpose and plan for our lives? Once we get comfortable, it's just really easy to stay there. See, for lots of people, they move into the part where they are forgiven, and they experience new life, and they've escaped the guilt and the shame, they've escaped the fear, and, and they're enjoying this new life, but then they never press beyond that to anything more. What else does God have for you? Aren't there dimensions of that life unfolding in ways that not only create greater depths and texture to your own life, but can make a difference in the lives of those around you? So we have to learn how to do this. And that means we have to be open to God's direction. We have to, we have to trust when it's time to act that we take that step. Escaping bondage is really good, but possessing God's promises is also good. Uh, second thing is, if you want to enter your next adventure, you need to know that God is with you too. It's very interesting. There was a phrase... Uh, 
uh, about verse 7 where uh, God is, is saying to Joshua, I'm going to elevate you in the eyes of all Israel. And it just sounds like that's kind of a political campaign so that everyone will think he's a good guy. Kind of a, a spin doctor is going to make him look good. But that's not, he, he clarifies the thought. He says, so that people will know that I am with you just like I was with Moses. That God is with us too. You see, God had been with Moses. But God also was going to be with him. This, this is what I want you to see. God's ability to do a work through you requires him to do a work in you. He's not just asking Joshua to fulfill an assignment. He's going to do something internally before he asks him to do something externally. He wants him to know, I was with Moses. I'm also with you. I wonder how many people in this room right now are not convinced that God is with you. At least not all the time. And this is one of the things that we have to get just driven into our soul. Whether we ever see a miracle or not does not change the fact that God is with us. Now, uh, in our world, we're constantly trying to verify ourselves, right? If you're applying for a job, you have to verify that you have to have so much education or so much experience. Uh, if, if you work in children's ministry around here, you have to have a background check because we want to make sure our, our kids are safe. And There's all kinds of things where we have to validate and verify. And, and people who know you kind of know what your skill sets are, what your abilities are, maybe what you're not so good at. And a lot of us just kind of live lives where everybody goes, well, yeah, th they could do that. I, I could see that. Maybe, maybe instead of living a life where people see what we're good at and they go, yeah, I, I, can, I can see where they would do that and give you credit for it. Maybe there's a way to live a life where God gets credit for it. That they look at you and they go, you know what? Uh, I, that surprises me a little bit. I, I wonder how they were able to pull that off. What is their connection and I think that's, that's the kind of life that God calls us to consider living. It's, it's fairly easy just to, to look back at something that we have done well and, and use that as our center. But please understand that our faith is not just an accurate remembrance of what God has done. Our faith is also a pursuit of what he wants to do in our lives. Trusting God for something miraculous. Oh, it, it, it's not about proving we're right. Uh, so in Christianity, there's kind of a, a couple of streams. This is interesting. There are some people, who, who, some people who are not very comfortable with any miracles at all. And they read through the Bible and they go, well, those are stories to illustrate other truths. And then there are some people who go, yep, God, God did that, but he's done. Like he, he, there's a period and he, he put it there and so he's done. And he's just kind of letting us work on the information that we've got. And then there's other people who think, no, if, if God's done things before, he can do things again. Not necessarily because we demand it or can control it, but we're open to that possibility. And here's the challenge, right? Here's what, here's what people in the I think God can still do this stream do. God will do a miracle. And what, what do we do? We turn around to the people in the, in the Christian faith who aren't quite as open to that. And, and what do we say? We say, you see? We're right. Uh, please understand this. The purpose of a miracle is not to prove we are right. The purpose of a miracle is to help us discover what the next step is in our lives and growth. What's that next adventure? So this idea that we have to go around and, and try to prove to people, that, that's not the goal. The goal is to discover for ourselves the next thing that God is calling us to. Now, the other thing is, is that if you're around groups of people who tend to believe in the miraculous, you're bound to run across somebody who is a little bizarre about it. Has anybody met anybody like that? Okay, they don't just pray. They, they pray like super loud. And, and they don't just lay hands on you. They knock you down. And, and, and they, 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 they can embarrass lots of people lots of the time. Is anybody know somebody like that? No? Is, is there anybody here who's kind of like that? Let's just, okay. I'd like to know where you're sitting this morning. <laughs> so miracles don't happen because of bizarre behavior. Miracles happen because of a simple dependence on God. We don't make them happen. We're just open to them happening. 
There's a very different thing there. We trust that God is with us. Whether we see a miracle or not, that's not the issue. That's, Joshua was going to learn this valuable lesson. Uh, last point this morning is that is to enter your next adventure, you must let God be God on his terms. It's not about trying to control God. The, people do this all the time. Well, if there's a God, then he needs to do this by this time, and then I will believe. And if he doesn't do it, then this is all a farce. Uh, that, that is not about letting God be God. That's about you trying to be God and get him to do what you want so your life is easier or you have less pain and that's not what miracles are about. Let God be God. Now, let me show you how this works out in the story. At the Red Sea, it was this spectacular thing. If you've seen any of the movies about it, the water just piles up on both sides and you walk through and, and uh, it's just really cool uh, visual effect. That had to be spectacular, it just did. But what we discover in reading the story in the, uh, the crossing of the Jordan River is that the water didn't pile up there. It says that it happened 20 miles upstream at a place called Adam, which I thought might have been a play on words saying it was a dam. But that's not what it actually was. It was just Adam. And so 20 miles, nobody can see 20 miles upstream. And there are scholars that have looked at this and said, well, given the topography of that kind of region and the torrential rains that were occurring and all of the flooding that was happening, it's not unlikely that there would have been some massive erosion and as a result, there would have been a significant mudslide that could have stopped the water for a short period of time. And so therefore, that's not really a miracle, that's just a natural occurrence. And, and then I will have people ask me, so do you think that it was you know, possibly a mudslide? And I'm perfectly comfortable with it being a mudslide. That doesn't make it any less miraculous. How do I know? Because God told Joshua, in three days, I'm going to take you across the Jordan. Who can forecast a mudslide three days ahead? That's a really useful skill they could use in California right now. <laughs> no. Some would say that's not a miracle. It's still a miracle. Because sometimes the evidence of a miracle is not in how extraordinary it looks, but in the timing of it. What's really fascinating is about, about this is this happened at the appointed time, and it lasted the right amount of time. Every single person got through. We have to be careful we don't become miracle snobs. That a miracle has to look a certain way for us to accept that God was involved in any way. You know, sometimes a person says, I don't understand it. I, I was diagnosed with cancer. I prayed that God would heal me. I still had to have surgery. I still had to have chemotherapy. I'm, I'm cancer-free now, but why didn't God answer my prayer? Why isn't it possible that God answered your prayer through surgery and through chemotherapy and partnering with the medical community? It was caught in time. Why is that not? Oh, oh! I prayed that God would, would help me financially. I was really struggling and, 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 and nothing. There, no finances came. I, I had to get a second job in order to make ends meet. How did you get that second job? How did that open up for you? What door opened that you had the opportunity and the ability to step into it at that moment at just when you... Why can't that be God too? I wonder how many times we don't recognize the supernatural intervention of God because it doesn't look like some kind of a sideshow with special effects. We should recognize it because it's perfectly timed. Perfectly timed. And that's what's cool. So the, 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 the children of Israel, first the priests go in. Now, I don't know about you. But if I'm carrying a heavy object, stepping into water, it hadn't stopped yet, I'm going to be anxious about this. And so I, they, they, they put their foot in, and as soon as the priests got their feet wet, the water stopped flowing. 20 miles upstream, it had stopped. And then Joshua told the priests, now just stay in the middle of the riverbed until we all get across. Now, once again, if I'm one of the priests... I, I would probably be, uh, my foot would be going up and down like this, and I'd probably be going, come on, move it, move it, move it, come on. <laughs> You're always dawdlers, you know. <laughs> I'm going to die because they're slow. That's not fair. 
And um, so why, why is this important? Well, what's interesting is then, even after all the people got across, the priests are about to walk out. You can read this in chapter 4, and Joshua just goes, no, hang on. And what? And he says, okay, we're going to have a contest. We're getting 12 guys, one from each of the 12 tribes, and we're going to see who can drag the biggest rock out of the middle of the riverbed onto the shore. And you know guys are going to own that one. They're just going to, I have no doubt, a couple hernias came out of that deal. You know, just got to prove something to somebody. And they get all the rocks out, and, and they piled them up and made an altar out of them. And then, then Joshua waved the priest in, and as soon as they got back in, the water starts flowing again. Not a tiny little stream, this raging torrent. And this is what Joshua told them. He said, look. Your children are going to see that pile of rocks and they're going to ask what that is and you can tell them this story. Please understand, it's doing two things, not just one. It's a way to remember what God has done, but it's also a way to inspire the next generation. This is what God did for us. I can't wait to see what he's going to do for you. Sometimes we turn our faith into just trying to prove that a previous generation was significant. Of course they were. The question is not, were they significant? The question is, what is God going to do in our current generation? Why do we invest as much as we do in our children and student ministries? It's because God has miraculous things he wants to do in their lives and through their lives that will transform the world around us. And I would just encourage you, you have stories as a believer. Maybe you don't tell them often because maybe they're a little bit embarrassing or maybe they're a little bit complicated. There are stories in my life of God's intervention that I have never shared publicly from a platform, and yet I did share them with our children in private conversations when we're sitting across the table in a restaurant on vacation. Because I want them to know, not just that your dad has experienced God, that's important, but I want them to know if he will do that for me, I can't wait to see what he's going to do in your life too. Share your stories. It inspires the next generation. Amen? All right. So you'll look at the bottom of your notes, and there's this phrase. It says, Heavenly Father, I choose to let you work in my life on your terms. We're going to pray this out loud and together in just a moment. But the second phrase says, Heavenly Father, an area I would love you to show yourself strong is in is, and I, I would like you to fill in that. Uh, for you, maybe it's relationally things are super hard. Maybe you feel very isolated and lonely. And you would like friends. Or maybe a relationship between a parent and child has become distant, strained, maybe even fractured. Maybe financially, you're just so underwater right now. You would love to be able to, to just not just have ends meet, actually have enough to, to be generous with someone else. Or maybe physically, you're just... Something is happening in your body that's limiting your capacity, or maybe even limiting the number of days you have left. And you'd really like God to do something about that. Would you just take a moment and, and fill that out? Just write that in at the bottom of your notes. So this morning, uh, this is how we are going to get our feet wet. We're all going to stand. And uh, maybe you're not completely convinced that God responds to conversations like this one. That's okay. Try having it anyway. Sometimes we put too much pressure on our own faith. Uh, let's just trust God to do something today. So we're going to read this passage this sentence out loud and together. And then when we get to the second one, we'll read it out loud and together. And then you're just going to read your part when you get there. And you might be going, well, I don't want anybody else to know. They're doing their own thing. Don't worry about it. And then we'll read the last sentence together. So let's begin this together. Ready? Heavenly Father, 
I choose to let you work in my life on your terms. Heavenly Father, an area I would love for you to show yourself strong is Heavenly Father, whisper to my heart the steps you desire for me to take. I'd like you just to bow your heads, close your eyes, and allow God to whisper something to your heart. Pay attention to the thoughts that come to your mind right now. Could that be a step for you to take? Father, I'm so grateful that you have heard every single one of our prayers, and I believe you've begun to whisper promptings and steps to take in direction to many of us that are in the room today, and I ask that you would help us have enough courage to take that seriously and act on it. I ask for what you are doing for individuals and families in this room today that you would also do for our church family that we are stepping into our own Jordan because we believe that there is an incredible promise that lies before us. And we don't want to just sit on the other side where life might be easier and less complicated. We're willing to cross to see what it is that you want to do in our lives and through our lives. I ask that you would help us with that in Jesus' name. Amen.